Turn in your King James Bible to Matthew chapter 7. It's important that you have a, a Bible in front of you for this study. Because you need to see what the Scriptures say. Not what your thoughts or your feelings or your emotions or whatever else say. Matthew chapter 7 verse 13 through 14. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. I'm going to talk to you today about why most Christians, put that in quotations, die and go to hell. You say, well now this is it. I'm going to prove it to you. If you go to Google and you type in a simple search that says, how many Christians are there in the world today? I did this, and it came up with this little statistic here. I think it was from 2010, 2.2 2 billion Christians. Okay, according to Google, according to accepted search engine queries. All right, I'm going to show you the problem with that in a minute here, but 2.2 2 billion people. So roughly, what, a quarter? Not quite a quarter of the people in the world today are saved. Uh, that doesn't sound like few people. Um, is Jesus lying or is Google lying? Or the Gallup poll or whatever it was that, that did this thing here. Who's lying? Hmm. Look down at Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in, 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 and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now, of course, dispensationally, doctrinally, this is pointed at people in the future. Okay, I understand that. The Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7, is more for somebody that's in the thousand-year reign of Christ. Absolutely. But it teaches a general truth. There will be people that get to heaven thinking that they're saved and they're not. Few there be that find it. You see? Now let me show you something very interesting. Turn in your, in your Bible to Revelation chapter 4. You say, can you prove how many people get to heaven? Well, not an exact number, but I can give you a pretty good number of how many Christians there actually are. The polls, Google, says that it's 2.2 billion, with a B. <laughs> billion. But what does the Bible say? Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately, immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Where's John at? Is he on the island of Patmos anymore, or is he in heaven? He's in heaven. What does he see? Verse 3. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Who are these 24 elders? They're Christians. Hmm. There are Christians in heaven when John gets there? 2.2 uh, billion? No, 24. You say, there's only 24 people saved? No, keep reading. Jump down to chapter 5, verse 8. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the, th the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, the Lamb there being Jesus Christ, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Who are the 24 elders? People say, I don't know, it's very mysterious. The 24 elders, I think it's probably the 12 apostles and the 12 Jewish patriarchs. Wrong, you blew it. How do you know? They're out of every kindred, tongue, people, nation. The apostles and the 12 patriarchs are all Jews. Okay? You look up Deuteronomy chapter 32, there are, God has separated the bounds, nations into certain boundaries. There are 12 nations. He separated them according to the number of the children of Israel. 12 boundaries. 
What's 12 times 2, class? 24. Okay? So when they say that we're saved by thy blood out of every kindred, people, tongue, nation, what they're saying is two from each of the 12 boundaries. It's simple. It's not some, oh, deep mystery. Oh, some scholar, uh, some great Bible commentator, he doesn't really know. Well, then he can't read plain English. Okay? And God sealed those things and you know, hasn't revealed them to him because he's got some kind of a sin issue. All right? I mean, it's just plain English. It's right there. But we have 24 elders. Verse 10. And hast made us unto our God, kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Millennial reign promised to Christians. 2 Timothy chapter 2 talks about it. Verse 11. You see, well, there's only 24. Keep reading. Verse 11. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was 2.2 billion as of the year 2. 2019. No, <laughs> the number of those angels. The number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. 10,000 times 10,000 is 100 million. Wait a second. No, no, because Google says it's 2.2 billion. And yet the angels there, I'll get back to that in a minute, the angels there Redeemed saints, in other words, um, there's only just over 100 million, a couple thousand more than 100 million, and the 24 elders. Somebody's lying. Jesus says, few there be that find it. The way which leadeth, you know, to, to death, to hell, is broad, and many there be which go in there at. Almost like 2.2 billion, you know. Um, but the way to heaven is small, narrow. Jesus says to a lot of the people that come, I never knew you. You're not redeemed. Hmm. So Jesus and John has it revealed to him that it's just over 100 million. A couple thousand over 100 million. But Google says it's 2.2 billion. Who are you going to believe? What about this thing of the angels, though? You say, well, are you saying the Christians are angels? Matthew chapter 22, verse 30 says, For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Um, there are other mentions of angels in the book of Revelation. And of course you go to uh, Revelation chapter 19, and John actually falls down before the feet of an angel, and he says, stand up. You know, so let's, let's go there. I'll just show you that verse real quickly here, in case you think that angels are not redeemed uh, saints. Uh, Revelation 19, verse 10. And I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See, thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. An angel there in heaven, and John falls down at his feet, and he says, I'm of thy brethren. Hmm. So in heaven, we are as the angels of God. And here's the really interesting part. That number of just over 100 million, that's all of church history. Not just, oh, the, the people that were there in the end times and if the, if the catching up happens here in 2019, um, it's, two, it's 100 million of that 2.2 billion. I mean, that would be a pretty significantly small number of the people that the world claims are saved Christians. 100, only 100 million of the 2.2 billion. But what's the real number? Almost 2,000 years of church history and only just over 100 million people got saved? How many people are going to be leaving when the rapture or the catching up happens? Not too many. Can you say amen to that as a Bible-believing Christian? <laughs> yeah. When you get to be a Bible-believing Christian, when you are born again and God saves you, you don't save yourself with your own intellect or with a little prayer that you prayed at the end of the service while they're passing the plate around, you know, for the offering and whatever. Uh, when God saves you and you're born again and your life changes, um, all of a sudden you start to realize that a lot of those uh, Christian friends and family and relatives, uh, they're actually lost. And you realize, uh, well, when the catching up happens, I wonder how many are going to go. Not very many. 
I don't even think it's in the hundreds of thousands. Maybe a few thousand worldwide. Less than, than you know, 100 at the very best. We'll say 100 million and, you know, 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands plus the 24 elders. So we'll just say it's 190 million people because that'd be under, you know, 200 million. 190, peop 190 million people. That's not that many for 2,000 years of church history. You say, well, I just can't imagine that God would be so narrow. Well, I, like uh, Jesus said, the way which leadeth unto life is narrow and few there, there be that find it. Kind of like God dealing only with one nation in the Old Testament. Hmm. Uh, God chooses things according to His own will. I'm not saying Calvinism and predestination or whatever. I'm saying uh, it's up to God to choose who gets saved and who isn't saved. But it's not nearly as many as people think. There aren't 2.2 billion Christians in the world today. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 13. Turn to Matthew chapter 13. Verse 18 through 23. The parable of the sower. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When any one heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away the wit that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. Now this is talking about, again, the kingdom of heaven. This is the physical kingdom that's coming. But as far as instruction and righteousness, as correction and reproof, this thing is true in any dispensation. This thing is true all throughout the Bible. You will have different people in the reaction to hearing the gospel. It doesn't matter what dispensation is. People will, will always react in similar ways. All right? The first one there. Anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, and cometh, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. You get somebody and they pull out and they get in behind me or whatever else and they see the gospel in the back and they, oh, what's that all about? This thing of Jesus dying for sins. Oh, huh? You know, what is that? Oh, here comes our turn. And they turn off and it's, Oh, hey, I just got a phone call. And they, they get on their phone and they're talking on their phone. Pretty soon they forgot all about that, that magnet on the back of the truck. Somebody sees a gospel tract laying there and they pick it up and they're looking at it. And somebody says, hey, are you ready to go? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and they throw it in the trash. And the cares and the deceitfulness and everything else of, of this world comes in and they forget all about that gospel that they heard. A lot of people like that. That's the vast majority of people. Verse 20, But he that receiveth the seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. Yet hath he no root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. How many times have I seen that? Good night. <laughs> That's the one I see the most. Okay? I see these people, they come along, I'm a King James Bible believer. Oh, praise the Lord, I can't, I can't thank you enough for the videos that you put out. You know, and, and oh boy, I've learned so much and everything else. And, and then they're they going to do their own ministry and whatever else. And all of a sudden, next thing you know, they start to get attacked. And they start to get some heat for being a Bible-believing Christian. And it's, oh, I didn't know that this was going to happen. I don't think I'm interested anymore. Goodbye. And all of a sudden, all the stands that they once supposedly took, they abandon them all. I'm not saying people that disagree with me. That's fine. I'm talking about somebody that's taken all these good stands and all of a sudden oh, they get offended and they just go, I don't believe any of that stuff anymore. I was in a cult. <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. Sure you were. Yeah. That's what lost people say about Bible-believing Christians. They call it a sect. Read the book of Acts. A lot of people like that. Verse 22, another type of person that hears the word. He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. There you have a false professing Christian that produces no fruit. Yeah, you say, well, no, it's a carnal Christian that they, they, they can produce the fruit, meaning that they are saved. They just get kind of carnal and they don't waste their time. Um, you forgot the, the, the portion of Scripture which we're going to be looking at. The fact that God purchases you. 
And God has a right to tell you what to do with your life. And if you don't listen, He's going to chasten you. He's going to punish you. And if you be without chastisement, then you're a bastard, according to the book of Hebrews. A bastard is a, a, somebody, a child that doesn't know their father. Funny that the Trinitarians talk about Jesus is not the father. They don't know who he is, you see. They don't understand that he and, and God the Father are one and the same being. Body and soul is the difference there, the distinction between the two. They don't know who their father is. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, it's not a carnal Christian. It's somebody who's a fake, who's a fraud. It's not, well, two, two lost groups there, you know, verses 19 and 20 and 21. Those are two different types of lost. And then, and then uh, you know, verse 22 there is a, is a saved but just carnal. No, it's lost. It's lost. They're not producing fruit. They're fake. A tree is known by its fruit. Oh, I'm a Christian and everything else. Uh, okay, where's the fruit? Where's the proof? Where's the changed life? Anybody can profess to be a Christian. You need to see some proof. Verse 23, But he that receives seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some, some an hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Um, when somebody gets genuinely born again, there's a major change that happens there. The Bible teaches the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. And the false convert says, well, good, I get the righteousness of Jesus Christ imputed to me so that then when I sin in the future... It's just all thrown on to Jesus. He's there suffering and dying on the cross. And hey, I get to live and I get to live in sin. And I just keep on heaping more pain on him. Well, that's a problem, first of all. Okay, uh, When you understand how Jesus suffered and died for your sins, you're not going to want to continue in those sins just willy-nilly. I don't care. I'm just going to keep on doing this stuff. I don't care. It's all paid for. I, got, I, have, a, I have a blank check. I can live however I want. No, that doesn't work. But there's a second aspect to the thing of Christ's imputed righteousness. Because when His righteousness is imputed to you, when it's given to you, that righteousness will shine through. I mean, I have had experiences where literally I am standing at a store and I don't say a word. I'm not glaring at people that are living in sin or doing whatever else. And people feel uncomfortable around me. And I'm dressed the same way. I got a flannel shirt on. I got jeans on. I got boots on. I'm not trying to be there, you know, screaming, repent, you know, I'm just standing there minding my own business and people, you know, they can feel something. Something's different about me. I get around lost men and, and all of a sudden their language starts to clean up and whatever else. I've seen it happen with my wife. She's born again. She's saved. She makes women uncomfortable. Of course, it's because she wears you know, dresses like a lady and actually wears dresses, but that's another issue. But, uh, you know, things change. Okay, give you a little analogy um, just to prove my point about imputed righteousness. What is imputed righteousness? Um, a couple days ago, got a phone call from the bank. This is just a story for illustration. Don't get excited. <laughs> get a phone call from the bank and they said, uh, Mr. Denlinger, you need to come down to the bank right away. There's somebody here that needs to meet you. Well, I'm a little bit busy. Sir, you need to come down. This is very important. Okay, all right. I head down to the bank. I go in there, and there's Bill Gates standing there. And they say, uh, Mr. Gates has something he'd like to tell you. And I walk over, and he says, uh, Mr. Denlinger, I understand that you have some financial problems and some of, some of your bills you can't pay and things. You don't have much money. So, and I know that you can't make as much money as I can. So I've decided that I'm going to give you my bank account and I'm going to take your bank account. I have all the paperwork ready here. Just sign on the dotted line. You sign and I get your bank account. And, and you know, I'll sign and I'll take your bank account. And I come home and I tell my wife about it. And she says, wow, things are really going to change now for us, aren't they? No, I'm still going to be the same old guy. I'm still not going to be able to pay bills or anything else. Well, you just signed the over and you got the bank account of a billionaire, didn't you? Yeah, but nothing changed. <laughs> you say, well, that's ridiculous. Of course your life would change if you all of a sudden had your bank account switched. Well, uh, how about your filthy, wicked, sinful life? And Jesus Christ says, 
I'm going to take that life and I'm going to give you my righteous, sinless life. I'm going to impute my righteousness to you, but nothing changes? Come on. A lot of false uh, ministries out there, a lot of false teachers telling you that your life doesn't have to change. You hear those words utter out of somebody's mouth, they say, your life doesn't have to change. Shut them off instantly. Next, we're going to go to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. Speaking of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Matthew 11, verse 28 through 30. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I mean, how many, how many of the 2.2 billion Christians out there, how many of them are, laden, or, or, are laboring and heavy laden? How many of them even care about the sin in their life? How many of them care about the deceitfulness of this world and the wickedness of this world and whatever else? You go to the church buildings, they're social clubs. That's all they are. You start to complain about the world and you'll get, they'll start to fidget and they'll kind of look at the ground and, oh, yeah, okay, uh, 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 they'll get nervous. Just like lost people. Two point two billion Christians. Yeah, my foot. <laughs> twenty nine, verse twenty nine. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. How do you like that for an image? You're a Christian, are you? Uh, is the yoke of Jesus Christ about your neck? Are you a bond servant, a slave? Another way to put it. How do you like that as an image? Jesus Christ standing there. He's got a chain going down to your neck. Yoke around the neck. Is that you? It's me. Hmm. 2.2 billion Christians, huh? I don't think so. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. You're to be yoked to Jesus Christ. But you're not to be yoked up to the world. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? How, when's the last time you called lost people around you infidels? How's that? Getting along with your community and whatever else. Good communitarianism. Uh, you're an infidel. I can't eat with you. Sorry, I can't fellowship with you. All the 2.2 billion Christians are doing that? I don't think so. You know better than that. Verse 16, And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate. Are you separate from the lost world? Does the lost world think you're nuts? So no, I, actually, I get along pretty good. Then you're lost. Well, how do you know? How can you judge that? I always love that. How, who are you to judge? How can you judge? I have a perfect standard, and I'm born again. I mean, what kind of an idiot preacher would you be paying that would say, I'm going to tell you how to get to heaven, but I don't really know who's going to heaven? How does that even make any sense? <laughs> Here's how to get to heaven, but I'm not really sure if it works. <laughs> Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Not many people doing that. First Baptist Church, all are welcome. I thought the Bible says not to be unequally yoked. You say, well, that's just marriage. Marriage has nothing to do with that. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 says, if a believer is married to an unbeliever, they're not to depart if they get along. Yes, you can be unequally yoked in marriage. It's talking about fellowship. It's talking about getting along with the lost world. The cares and the deceitfulness of riches springing up. You false convert you. See, well, you're, being, you're being so harsh. I'm trying to get you to realize that you're lost. 
if you're not genuinely born again. Why? Because I want you to get saved. We're going to talk about that as we continue. The worst thing out there is a preacher that's not going to tell you the truth. That's going to lead you to believe that there are 2.2 billion Christians out there. When the Bible plainly teaches that it's just over 100 million in 2,000 years of church history. The worst enemy you have is a preacher that's not going to tell you the truth. I'm not your enemy. I had to come to a place where I realized I am a false convert. I was born and raised in church. I was a professing Christian. I was one of the 2.2 billion. And I got to a point where I looked at this book and I said, this book is a dead book to me. There's some nice little life lessons and whatever else, but I have no fellowship at all with the people in this book. I can't, I'm not going through what they're going through. I don't understand this book. And I started to get afraid. And I started to say, God, I don't know. I don't know if I'm really saved. And I got scared. I don't want to go to hell when I die. Please, God, show me the truth. And it wasn't just, you know, Oh, this angel, you know, light come down through my window and I'll, I'll save you now because you said a thing or you believed it in your heart or whatever. Oh, no, no. There was a process there. I had to come to the end of myself, you see. Still holding on to the world a little bit too tight. Still holding on to my uh, goodness. I had to come to the end of myself. And the Lord put his yoke upon my neck. I bought you now. Here's my righteousness. You're going to have a changed life. You're going to give up some of those things that you've been doing. Those things that my word says is sin. And then you'll start to have fellowship with the saints that are in this book. And the Bible is going to start to make sense. Yeah. 1 <clears throat> Corinthians chapter 15. You say, well, I, I, I know for sure I'm saved because I've believed the gospel. Therefore, I know I'm saved. Another way that you can spot a heretic very quickly is that they'll tell you the 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 through 4 just teaches belief or the blood atonement. That's another funny one because it's not even mentioned in there. The Jesus died on the cross, yeah, he shed his blood, but the blood atonement's not mentioned by name. But look, look at this. Very important here to get this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. By which also ye are saved, if, conditional clause, if, ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless, unless, ye have believed in vain. Question. 2.2 billion Christians, they all say that they believe in Jesus. How many of them have believed in vain? According to the scriptures, there's just over 100 million. How many does that leave? 2.2 billion minus 100 million? And that's, we'll just say that's for today. We're not even talking all church history. Just for today. How many people have believed in vain? Billions, billions, and billions. You get down through church history? I have no idea how many faithful Roman Catholics and faithful Protestants and faithful Baptists and whatever else died and went to hell into the billions, possibly hundreds of billions. They believed in vain. Verse 3, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and then He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. There's the Gospel. Jesus Christ died for your sins. But most people have a reason that they don't want to believe in that. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Second Corinthians chapter 7, verses 10 through 11. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of. You know how many people uh, were uh, born and raised a uh, <clears throat> Christian? I was born and raised in a Christian home. And then I went to the university and I became an atheist. You believed in vain. You're not saved. Verse 10, But the sorrow of the world worketh death. People get uh, sorry for things that have happened in their life, but they're not sorrow, sorrowful towards God. When they die, they commit suicide. Verse 11, For behold this selfsame thing, that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, 
What carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement desire. Yea, what zeal. Yea, what revenge. In all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. You want to come to me and say that you're a Christian? There's going to be an approval process. Hey, uh, brother, I'm a Christian. I'll just take your son off here into the woods and stuff. I'll go for a nice little walk with your son. Okay, you said you're a Christian, so go ahead. No, that's what Catholics do. Oh, Father, so-and-so wants my child to come in back into his office someplace and help him with some uh, <coughs> work he has to do. Next thing you know, your child comes home and they're acting a little bit strange. And you find out years later they were molested by the priest. What's the problem? That priest, he made a profession but he wasn't approved, you see. He was a fake. He was a fraud. Are you in that number? Are you a fake? Are you a fraud? Second Corinthians chapter 13, you say, well, I think you're doing the work of the devil. He's doing the work of the devil because he's causing me to question my salvation. He's causing me to, to say, I don't really know for sure. Then Paul is in the same uh, vein as me. Let me read it to you here. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. Examine yourself. I know I'm saved. Okay? And my Bible tells me who's saved and who's not. I mean, you know, I don't know all of you per personally, excuse me, but... Um, I've had people that, you know, I thought were saved for a while and, and then they convinced me that, that, they, were, that they were not. Um, there are certain things you can't do as a Christian. Okay? Um, certainly. But uh, when it comes right down to it, it's about you having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. The Bible talks about that I may know Him. So again, don't let the false prophets come out and say, there's no scripture saying personal relationship. Uh, what do you think that I may know Him means? Okay? <laughs> Uh, yeah, there is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ that's necessary for salvation. Uh, it's there. Okay? And uh, the most important thing that you can do is you need to examine yourself. I mean, it's not very good odds when you have 2.2 billion according to Google, and yet the Bible says just over 100 million in 2,000 years of church history. You don't have a very good chance of getting in. Just to be quite frank with you, few there be that find it. Unless you want to deny the words of Jesus Christ and say, oh, there, ah, there's a lot of people that are saved. There's a lot of people going to be in heaven. They're just carnal. You better examine yourself. You better do some real soul searching. Because if you blow it, if you mess it up and just say, eh, whatever, doesn't matter. I believed. I did the little thing. I, I'm part of a good New Testament local church, whatever that is. Um, I, I, I'm, I think I'm good. You don't examine yourself. You will end up in hell for all of eternity. Like the vast majority of professing Christians in the last 2,000 years. The vast majority of people that professed to be saved, professed to be Christians, are frying in the heart of the earth right now. Weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth. Better get it figured out. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 2, For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and the day of salvation have I secured thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You say, well, I don't know. I, you've given me some things to think about, but I'll just have to pray on this. and whatever. You better get saved. Nobody is guaranteed tomorrow. You better get saved, and you better do it now. But look at the verse there. I have heard thee in a time accepted. There's a whole false movement on YouTube, a bunch of losers that have no life, and they come out and they say, there's no prayer for salvation. You can watch these people, they, they stalk me all the time. They stalk me religiously. It is their religion to stalk me. Um, they, it's, it's their purpose in life. Okay? <laughs> and they say, there's no prayer for salvation. You don't call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. Shut them off. Instantly, you know they're false. Why? I have heard thee in, uh, I have heard thee in a time accepted and in the day of salvation have I secured thee. Secured means helped. You can't help yourself. You can't save yourself with your own self-righteousness. 
You need God's help. You need His yoke put around your neck. You need His righteousness to be in your life, to clean up your filthy, dirty, wicked life that you currently have. Going to church isn't going to save you. Just as simple as that. If there was a lottery um, for who's saved and who's not, uh, your odds are really bad. Everybody's odds are really bad. Not that many people getting in. You better examine yourself today. And you better not listen to false prophets that tell you that there's no changed life after salvation. That's one of the quickest ways you can tell somebody's false. Okay? Uh, you can do what you want with your life, but uh, nothing is more important than your salvation. I pray you take heed to what I've said. I pray you think about these things and that you get it straightened out today, right now. King James Video Ministries has been faithfully preaching and teaching from God's Word since 2008. Our YouTube channel has never been monetized, and we do not accept money from the lost world because this would violate the Scriptures. King James Video Ministries is supported by saved brethren in accordance with 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17 through 18. If you have been blessed by our videos, we would ask that you prayerfully consider supporting this ministry financially. You can donate online by visiting www.kingjamesvideoministries.com or by sending a check or money order to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 214, Patton, Maine, 04765. Thank you to all who donate to this ministry, and we pray for the Lord's blessing in your lives.